Hello, everybody. Um, quite a bit of what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so has been quite heavily trailed already uh, with the awards, uh, the runner-up award to Angie Jackson and the Web Archiving team for the wonderful work with the Shine project. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I hope um, for 10 minutes or so explain why the work that they're doing is so important, and we should be so grateful to them and their colleagues that they're preserving this data for us. Uh, Andy mentioned that I was involved with an AHRC-funded research project, and that was to work with a data set of the archive of the .uk web domain from 1996 to April 2013. Uh, and that was derived from the Internet Archive, and it covers the period up to legal deposit legislation kicking in in the UK, which allows the British Library to do this archiving themselves. So first of all, some facts and figures. And for a humanities researcher, uh, some of this is, is really quite mind-boggling. This, this is really big data for us. Uh, possibly not for people who work in computer sciences, but it's certainly beyond uh, what we're able to work with comfortably. Even the index pages of some of this uh, I couldn't work with on my PC. So the historical data set uh, that I and my team were involved with, as I said, covered 1996 to April 2013. There are over 3.5 billion distinct records, and that's 65 terabytes of data. So it's a lot of material to work with. And just to show you the rate of growth that's happening, that's the whole of that period. Just in 2014, when a uh, domain crawl was done here under legal deposit legislation, that came to not far off the same in terms of volume of data, with 56 terabytes, 2.5 billion web pages and other assets, uh, including 4.7 gigabytes of viruses. So there's all sorts of stuff in there. Um, and that's one of the problems with it. It's a big bucket of stuff. Uh, some of it's been captured properly, some of it hasn't. We don't know entirely what's in there, what it looks like, what we can do with it. We're at very early stages in working with this data. Um, the Shine, this was uh, Shine version 1 before it was improved enormously by the team here and their hard work. Uh, and that allows searching, full text searching of um, that legacy data set. We had a period for, of about a week where it was the largest full text index of web or archive files in the world. Uh, and then sadly, uh, the Danish web archives produced a larger one. But we cling on to that week when it was the largest one that existed. Um, there's also some associated data, and this one's been slightly superseded by the fantastic announcement of the data at BL Labs launch today. Um, but these are, are files that are easier for people to work with. They're lists of all the crawled URLs, um, the host link graph, which shows which sites link to each other. But even the list of unique URLs crawled is too big for me to work with easily on my PC in my office. So uh, we're really starting to get into difficult territory for humanities researchers who don't have the kind of support that Melissa was talking about this morning. Um, I thought, since we're here, uh, I might as well do a search for British Library to see what exists in that historic data set. And you get hundreds of thousands of results, even limiting it to just instances of the BL's own website, you get 892,000. So that's a lot of data to work with. Um, as a humanities researcher, I immediately want to drill down into that and see what's there and get that micro view of what's going on. So the very first instance in the Internet Archive data set of the British Library's website is this one here from October the 19th, 1996, when it was then called Portico and, and was, as was fashionable at the time, a gateway into um, information about the British Library. And poking around in that a bit more, you come to a page that talks about its just recent move to St Pancras and talks about all the work that's going on. So already you've got the whole history of this building is contained in that archive. So for a historian, that's a fantastic resource to work with. What kinds of research questions can humanities scholars um, pursue with this data? Uh, the project that I was involved with, uh, we had ten, nine bursaries that we gave out um, to early career researchers who just had a humanities research project that they hadn't really thought about using web archives for to come along, work with us and work with the development team here at the British Library and just try and see what they could find, what they could do, what sort of data was available to them. And the really wonderful thing about this archive is its heterogeneity. There is so much in there, from government information to newspapers to blogs to video to audio. 
Um, it's not confined to a single type of information. So you can really look at patterns of information flow and communication and all sorts of different types of material and voices are in there, from the very official voices to people starting to use social media for the first time to talk in very personal ways. And you can see from this range of projects the huge variety of things that were possible from people who hadn't even considered working with this material before. The ideas that were sparked were fantastic. Um, the third one down, revealing British Euroscepticism in the UK web, seems particularly pertinent now. Um, and there is a, an, a, an EU referendum or Brexit special collection being developed that's being led by uh, the Bodleian Libraries. So again, that's, going to, that's already going to be an amazing resource for people uh, looking to see what might have been changed on particular websites relating uh, to Brexit and so on. But in 10, 20 years' time, it's going to be even more significant. And you won't find that anywhere else. You'd get partial snapshots of that discussion in other archives, but it's all in the web archive from the newspaper papers onwards. Um, a fantastic project that a researcher called Harry Raffle did on the online development of the Ministry of Defence, and he happened to come across a wonderful um, a page that was up when the site was down, and the only piece of information on there was a phone number for recruiting to the army. So it didn't matter that all of the rest of the information was inaccessible, so long as you could still ring up to inquire about joining the army. And that says a lot about the priorities of the organisation, and that's just a serendipitous capture in the web archive which is really hard to find if you're working at huge scale. It's the kind of thing that you, you only really come across when you're poking around in a much lower level of detail. Um, some of the other things that you can do, it has fantastic potential for linguistic research. There are all sorts of health warnings. We heard again from Melissa earlier this morning about engrams, and there's lots of duplicated material in this archive. But for tracing neologisms, it's fantastic because you go from there being no mentions at all to it suddenly um, appears as big data in this case. But the alignment with the OED word of the year is particularly interesting. Uh, so in 2004, the word of the year, rather unfortunately, I don't think this reflects terribly well on us as a society, uh, was chav. And you can see it goes from almost no mentions at all to suddenly spiking in the data. And similarly, with Credit Crunch in 2008, um, oh, sorry, that's, I've skipped over, I missed one out, I haven't got the Credit Crunch slide, we'll go straight to steampunk, which is a genuine neologism, and you're seeing the emergence of that word in the archive, it goes from 16 mentions in 1996 to sudden peak in 2008, and for linguistic researchers, this is fascinating, the potential is huge, um, but as I say, so long as we approach it cautiously and understand more about the archive, which is a point Melissa made this morning. Um, using some of those index files, quite crude here, and there's a lot more detail hidden under this, you can start to look at things like um, what type of format is in there, uh, how much, what's the relationship between text and images, total unique URLs over time. This is just three years. Um, and there are you know, hundreds of types of applications that are captured in the data as it goes along. And you can see file formats becoming obsolete. You get lots of them in one year and then nothing in the next year. So really interesting stuff for the history of the internet too. And why it's important, uh, this slide produced by Andy Jackson shows precisely why it's important. These are URLs in the archive and the dark gray and black color, uh, they're the ones that are now missing from the live web. So even the stuff that was captured in 2014, almost half of it has gone from the live web or has changed dramatically. So this data is really important and it's the only place where we have access to it. Um, and it's, it's really, we're keeping ahead of it, it needs to be constant activity. Um, just a few future research avenues. Um, there isn't a single archive of the UK web. There are multiple partly overlapping versions from the common crawl to the data that the on government web space that the National Archives has to the Internet Archive to the British Library. How do we decide what UK web space looks like? There's a big piece of work there to compare all of that. Um, a project that I'm particularly interested in is discussing how migration's been discussed online over the past 25 years and how concepts flow between newspapers and government documents to the way ordinary people are talking about these ideas. 
And we've also got a postdoc who will be starting in my institute uh, in February who's going to look at translingual communities on the web and how they preserve their cultural identi identities in online spaces. And multiple languages are a really interesting thing in this data set. So um, that's all. I hope that's explained some of the possibilities of this data without dwelling too much on the problems. Um, and these are all of the fantastic people without whom, as they say, in the spirit of the awards, none of this would have been possible. So thank you very much. Thank you.